This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. A dozen or so years ago, most analytic philosophers would have found the following picture self-evident. Much, though by no means all philosophy, involves the generation of ingenious cases about which philosophers have relatively strong and consistent intuitions. Such intuitions are a significant source of evidence for philosophical analysis. Of late, this picture has come under attack. Some say uh, intuition is nothing more than a pompous word for belief, and that our beliefs are not, simply because they are our beliefs, a source of philosophical evidence. Some observe that intuitions are supposed to have various hallmarks. Intuitions are supposed to have a particular phenomenology or issue simply from insight into conceptual structure. And they complain that they're unaware of any such phenomenology and dubious about conceptual structure. Some say that since intuitions vary with the culture of their possessors, their usefulness as evidential fodder is compromised or worse. In what follows, I will defend a version of the picture most of us used to find self-evident. That picture, I think, reflects something important about philosophy and one of the reasons it's worthwhile doing. My plan is this. I first say what I take intuitions to be. I then say something about the idea that philosophical analysis involves, but is not exhausted by, conceptual analysis. I think there's something to this idea something I hasten to add that even a Quinean could endorse. I will point to how intuitions understood in the way that I propose to understand them obviously provide evidence for conceptual and thus philosophical analysis. And I'll close by comparing the view that I sketch with Hermans, who is no friend of the idea that philosophy needs intuition. There is, I think, not all that much different distance between the view I outline here and the views of many others who think that intuitions are philosophical evidence and Herman's view. Some of the difference between Herman and the advocates of intuition strikes me as merely verbal. There may, however, be some substantive differences between Herman and me, uh, in particular one that has to do with what we can reasonably expect philosophical analysis to deliver. I won't try to define philosophical analysis. But it's the sort of thing that philosophers are doing when they offer or criticize what are meant to be illuminating accounts of the conditions under which objects have a property or relation. It's the sort of thing you find when the philosopher, after 20 or so pages of chiseling away at various definitions, triumphantly displays something of the form of K. S knows that P if and only if dot, 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 and declares the Gettier problem solved. A case, as I shall use the term, is a description of an apparently possible situation. Intuitions are things that are made manifest by a strong, relatively stable inclinations to apply something predicative, a phrase or a concept, to something as described in the case. That doesn't yet tell us what intuitions are, but it does, I think, have implications about what they are not. There's no need for an intuition to involve distinctive phenomenology, for example, since the strong and stable inclinations that manifest them generally do not. Intuitions presumably don't correspond to spontaneous or snap judgments, at least not to ones that are immediately accessible to consciousness. Confronted with a putative counterexample to an analysis of, say, X acts freely and doing such and so, I may at first not know what to say about it, in part because I go back and forth between an inclination to think the case is a case of free action and an inclination to say that it is not. Indeed, we have all found on occasion that our intuitions are at war with themselves. I may, after reflection, have a strong inclination to say that something is a case of free action, perhaps in part because it so clearly patterns with paradigms of free action, as well as a strong inclination to say that the case is not such perhaps because it has elements that I am committed to saying are incompatible with free agency. So what exactly are intuitions? There are, I think, two primary possibilities. They're psychological states, 
judgments or inclinations to judge focused on propositional contents, or they are the contents of some such states. The dominant use of intuition, I think, identifies them with judgments about possible cases. So that, for example, my intuition about Goldman's Barn case is either my making a particular judgment about it or is the content of that judgment. Because conflicting intuitions need not issue in judgments, I don't think this is the best way to use the term. Better, it seems to me, to identify intuitions with either strong and stable inclinations to make a judgment about a case or with the content of the judgment one is thus inclined to make. I'll be non-committal about the content of the relevant judgments, though I am inclined to endorse the idea that, for example, the content of the intuition that Alvin Goldman is focused on when he presents the case of Henry driving about in fake barn country is something like P1. There is a handout, I hope you know, all right? All right. Um, so uh, da, 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 da. Right, I'll be non-committal about the content of the relevant judgments, though I'm inclined to endorse the idea, for example, that the content of the intuition that Goldman is focused on when he presents the case of Henry driving about faint barn country is something like P1. It's metaphysically possible that someone be like Henry is, now put in a description of Goldman's case, but not know that he is looking at a barn. This is. Um, very close to a view that you have, have uh, uh, put forward. But nothing, I think, will, that I say will turn on niceties about the content of an intuition. Goldman's intuition is thus either his strong and stable inclination to judge P1, or it's the content of that potential judgment. Which one is it? Philosophers who toil at finding biconditionals like K often call what they are up to conceptual analysis. I take it that those who use this moniker think that a successful philosophical analysis would, among other things, tell us something not just about a property or relation, but about our concept of it. The idea, I take it, is that a philosopher who offered K prime, knowledge is reliably generated through belief, as an analysis or philosophical account means to be doing two things. One. She's telling us that the relation of knowledge is instantiated just if the properties and relations mentioned on the right side of K prime are instantiated in the right way. Two, she is also telling us that the concepts of being reliably generated, being true, and being a belief are part of or help constitute our concept of knowledge. The idea, that is, is that when philosophical analysis is successful, it tells us something about conceptual structure. I hereby dub this idea CIA. Unfortunately, I can't remember why I dubbed it CIA. <laughs> it has something to do with concepts and intuition and analysis. CIA needs elaboration. It is not always clear what philosophers have in mind when they speak of concepts, and it is certainly not clear what conceptual structure is supposed to be. And it's not totally clear why an analysis of, say, the concept of knowledge, which one would think is something that is in some broad sense psychological, would be helpful to someone who is looking for illumination about the relation of knowledge. On any way of understanding the philosopher's talk of concepts, concepts have a semantics. They, or their applications, can sensibly be said to be true or false of objects. Some see concepts as, in some sense, internal and thus idiosyncratic. Others as, in some sense, external and common property. On the first view, concepts are categories, enduring psychological structures that are involved in classification, are in some way involved in occurrent beliefs and memories, and are, in language users, in some important way connected with the meanings of the words they use to form their canonical names. Categories are naturally thought of as idiosyncratic to their possessor, as they are structures naturally individuated in terms of knowledge and perceptual abilities that vary across individuals. Others think of concepts as shared by different individuals, so that, for example, normal adult humans have the same concept of physical object and agent, and normal English speakers express the same concept with the words accident and mistake. 
If you think of word meanings as one kind of concept, and think that members of a single language community typically mean the same thing when they use everyday vocabulary items, you will probably be partial to this uh, latter view. If CIA is part of a proposal about how to best understand philosophical practice, we should take the concepts philosophers analyze to be shared ones. For whatever the target of such analysis may be, it is something that is public in the banal sense that when different philosophers try to give an account of knowledge or reasons for action or reference or whatever, they presuppose that they're all trying to give an account of the same thing. I infer this last bit from the way in which what is usually identified as philosophical analysis proceeds. If you look at arguments over cases and over what our intuitions about them tell us, it is striking that we do not argue from intuitions, that is, from judgments about cases, that we do not take to be widely shared. The weight we are willing to assign to an intuition seems to be a function not of how strong our own inclinations are, but of how widely the intuition is sh shared. And one just doesn't see philosophers retreating when their intuitions are disputed by saying that they are only trying to give an account of their own concepts. We all agree that if A's analysis of knowledge is correct and B's intuitions conflict with it, B's intuitions are messed up even if they accurately reflect his idiosyncratic concept of knowledge. Suppose this much is accepted. What exactly is the conceptual structure that analysis illuminates? What is it for P's being true to be part of the concept of my knowing P? Well, we're thinking of a concept as something that we first and foremost share with others. Many, perhaps most of our concepts are acquired from others. We learn the rudiments of concept application from others. We work with them to decide how to apply concepts in diff difficult cases. When differences over application are manifest, we argue and negotiate. Even when a concept apparently has an innate basis, as presumably the concept's object and agent do, their contours are elaborated through social interaction. Having a concept is in part a matter of being connected to a social network, a group of people who make use of the concept in particular ways, who recognize one another as using the same concept, and who have mutual expectations about how the concept is normally deployed. Not only is it the norm that those who can think of someone as a brother will think of someone as such only if they think of him as a male, it is the norm that we expect those who think of someone as a brother to think of him in this way. We know that there's something abnormal, something in need of explanation, if someone thinks not all brothers are male. Let's let big C be a concept that is expressed in English by little c. Let P be the claim made by some sentence of the form phi of little c in which little c occurs. Say that P is part of the explicit concept of big C if it's such that it is mutually known by those who have the concept big C, that those who have it are expected to believe P. I know, and you do too, that if someone knows what a brother is, they will expect people who know what a brother is to be male. Not only do you and I know this, you and I know that you and I know it, and so on. The claim that brothers are male is part of the explicit concept of the concept brother. There is no need for the explicit content of a concept as just defined to be true. Arguably, it was once part of the explicit content of the concept whale that whales were not mammals. Many of the arguments given by Putnam against traditional accounts of kind terms are examples of cases in which it turns out that part of the explicit concept, content of a concept is false. I'm not going too fast, am I? Am I going too slow? No. Yeah, I know her. Uh, it seems to me that the explicit content of a concept will usually be of limited philosophical interest. There are, of course, many things that are mutual knowledge about knowledge that no one has brought to consciousness. For example, that Plankton don't know much about physics. But one doesn't design thought experiments to get it. Explicit content. So what is one getting at 
when one comes up with an ingenious example like Gettier's or Goldman's? Well, the explicit content, content of a common concept hardly exhausts its content. Take Austin's shop-worn but nice examples from the article A Plea for Excuses that illustrate the difference between doing something by mistake and doing it accidentally. Is the difference these illustrate part of the concept's explicit content? Do all or even most competent speakers know before they read Austin's footnote that someone who knows what it is to do something by accident expects anyone who knows what accidental action is to know that in the case in which the donkey Austin aims at moves and he thus shoots the neighbor's donkey, it was done by accident, not by mistake? I'd say no. And not just because most people are unfamiliar with Austin's example. Most people who have the concepts of acting by mistake and acting accidentally have not thought very hard about them. They picked up the concepts by seeing them applied in various cases, acquiring dispositions that more or less match those of everyone else, at least in a broad range of everyday cases. They have stable inclinations to apply the terms, ones that overlap with those of others, but they've not articulated those inclinations to themselves or to others. When the competent speaker reads the footnote, that's where the examples are, and judges this one's by mistake, that one's by accident, she's not applying an explicit rule from which the judgment is an easy consequence. She's not doing something that she had a prior expectation that she or anyone else would do. Neither did she have prior knowledge from which such an expectation is an easy consequence. This isn't to say that she didn't know what it is to do something by mistake or by accident. It is rather to say that to have that kind of knowledge does not require very much in the way of conceptual articulation. What is surprising is that while most people cannot articulate the difference between mistake and accident, almost everyone immediately gets the example and makes the judgments about them Austin expects. There's presumably something about our practice of labeling things as mistakes or accidents that leads to convergence here. There's some set of properties and relations, or some degree of some magnitude, or something else made manifest in the example, to which our classifications are sensitive, and which explains our convergence. When this sort of thing is true of a concept, and the something is not exhausted by its explicit content, say that the concept has implicit content. Implicit content is implicit, and it needs to be articulated. Though pretty much everyone agrees in their judgments about Austin's cases, it's actually pretty difficult to project from the cases to an account of the difference. Such an articulation would involve claims along the lines of ones like A. We take such and such properties to suffice for something to fall under the concept accident. We take such and such properties to be necessary for something to fall under the concept mistake, where the properties and questions are ones sensitivity to which explains our converging judgments. Since implicit, along with explicit, content is what sparks application, and our common patterns of application can be erroneous, articulations of such content need to be made in this form. Though, of course, it will often turn out that something stronger can be said, something along the lines of a prime. Such and such properties suffice for something to be an accident. Such and such properties are necessary for something to be a mistake. As I see it, those who think the philosophical analysis involves uncovering conceptual structure think such analysis aims at uncovering implicit conceptual structure in the sense that I have been trying to elucidate. Their hope is to come up with truths that look like the claims in A. They suspect that often enough, those truths will lead to truths like those in A prime. It seems to me obvious that many philosophers have understood what they were up to as conceptual analysis in more or less the sense I have been trying to isolate. Certainly John Austin and other ordinary language philosophers did. Austin counsels us that at least sometimes in philosophy, and I'm going to quote from a plea for excuses, sometimes in philosophy we are to proceed from ordinary language 
that is, by examining what we should say when, and so why and what we should mean by it. Ordinary language, Austin goes on to say, embodies something better than the metaphysics of the Stone Age, namely the inherited experience and acumen of many generations of men. If a distinction works well for practical purposes in ordinary life, no mean feat, for even ordinary life is full of hard cases, then there's sure to be something in it. It will not mark nothing. Yet this is likely enough to be not the best way of arranging things if our interests are more extensive or intellectual than the ordinary. Everyday experience has not been fed from the resources of the microscope and its successors. Superstition and error and fantasy of all kinds do become incorporated in ordinary language. Only when they do, why should we not detect it? Certainly then, ordinary language, analysis of implicit conceptual structure, is not the last word. In principle, it can everywhere be supplemented and improved upon and superseded. Only remember, it is the first word. End of quote from Austin. Austin is suggesting here, I think, that philosophy at least begins by understanding the conceptual connections and distinctions that are explicit and implicit in the experience and acumen of many generations, which is what I just suggested we should take to be the structure of a shared concept. I would have thought that it was obvious that a good many philosophers, Plato and Moore strike me as good examples, would recognize themselves as engaged in cognate investigations. I imagine that some will say that this is a misleading picture of philosophical analysis. When, for example, Alvin Goldman reasons about the case of Henry in fake barn country, he reasons quite explicitly to an account of knowledge, not to an account of our concept of knowledge. No matter, the objection goes, what Austin might say, he's after an account of the difference between a mistake and an accident, not an account of the difference between our concepts of these. Save when they're doing some part of philosophy of mind concerned with concepts or representations, the objection concludes, philosophers are concerned with analyzing properties, not concepts of properties. To this, I respond that the suggestion was not that philosophical analysis was concerned solely with concepts and their structure. Of course, we're as much interested in the properties and relations our concepts are concepts of as we are in the concepts themselves. One might counter that dragging concepts into an account of philosophical practice only obfuscates it. A philosophical account of, say, knowledge or free action aspires to something like a true, illuminating, and possibly necessary account of what is necessary and sufficient for someone to know P or to act freely in doing such and such. Applying the concept of knowledge to cases is nothing more or less than thinking about what's necessary or sufficient for knowledge. The idea that we're thinking about our concepts when we're thinking about knowledge is about as plausible, it might be said, as the idea that we're looking at a mental image when we're looking at a barn. So the response goes. One reason to think that this response is too hasty is that it ignores the possibility, a possibility that is often a probability, that philosophical analysis may be a worthwhile enterprise in cases in which there is no property for the analysis to be an analysis of. All there is for us to analyze in many cases of philosophical interest is our concepts. Take free action as an example. Some philosophers tell us that to act freely would, to be, would be to perform an act, the performance of which was not determined by conditions over which one has no control. Others tell us that to act freely is, roughly put, to perform an act such that one could have decided not to perform it and would not have performed it had one so decided. Yet other accounts are on offer. There's no consensus amongst philosophers, or amongst non-philosophers for that matter, about which of these accounts of free action we should endorse. This is in good part because all of the accounts have, I hope I will be allowed to put it this way, considerable intuitive appeal. Each of them invokes elements that are more or less central to the way we think about free action, elements that we are loath to write out of our way of thinking about it. Why should we think that when we use the phrase free action in speech or token it in our thought, it is determinate that we are picking out 
the property isolated by one as opposed to another of these candidate analyses of free action. I do not ask this rhetorically. I'm open to being convinced that we do determinately mean something more or less co-intensive with one of these analyses or with one that no one has been clever enough to hit upon yet. But it seems obvious that A, we're owed an argument for this, given that our intuitions about free action are divided and wobbly. B, it is not at all implausible that free action does not determinately denote. And C, if it doesn't, then all those interested in philosophical problems linked to the notion of freedom can do is to describe the varying strands in our concept of free action and make recommendations based on the interests we do or might have as to how we might eliminate the vagueness of the concept. I do not say that all or even most of the notions philosophy investigates suffer from the kind of indeterminacy I've suggested may infect the notion of free action. But I do say that it is very probable that some, and not improbable that many, do. There's a somewhat different sort of indeterminacy from which many notions of philosophical interest arguably suffer. One that gives another reason to interpret philosophical analysis as at least in part a kind of conceptual analysis. Consider my dog, who is capable of rudimentary thought. She can, for example, think that I have thrown a ball. Many such uh, thoughts are presumably realized by mental structures that deserve to be called concepts, structures that are used in categorization, that are invoked in memory, are implicated in the planning and rudimentary reasoning the dog engages in, and so forth. Consider now the project of determining the extension or possible world's intention of the canine ball concept that helps realize the dog's belief that I just threw a ball. The project is not obviously absurd and might even be worth contemplating, if only because it raises interesting questions about interpretation and intentionality. What is absurd is the suggestion that it is even close to determinate for every ballish X whether the dog's concept is true of X. Surely my Sheltie's dispositions to behavior and her knowledge of the world support neither the claim that the concept mobilized when she thinks I threw a ball is true of a football the size of a car, nor the claim that the concept is false of such. An investigation into the semantics of Sheltie thought is an investigation in semantics, and thus an investigation into what properties the dog is, and what properties dogs are thinking about in some sense of property. But the properties in question are partial. And to get a grip on the way in which they are partial, we have no choice but to look at the structure of the canine concept and its deployment. Why exactly should we think that it is any different when it comes to the analysis of human thought? It is a banal observation indeed that we have not anticipated all the cases in which we might be puzzled as to whether a particular word or concept applies. It is a less banal but no less correct observation that our dispositions, world knowledge, and environmental relations do not come close to determining what our reactions to novel cases will or should be. It's implausible, in my opinion, that an appeal to some metric of naturalness will erase very much of the indeterminacy here. Like the dogs, our thoughts are partial in the sense that it is very often a vague matter whether their predicative elements are true or false of the things we are thinking about. There's either no fact of the matter, or there might as well be no fact, since the facts are unknowable. As in the case of Sheltie semantics, to get a grip on what we are thinking, we have no choice but to look at the structure of our concepts and their deployment. If we as philosophers are interested in what we're thinking when we think about knowledge, freedom, or the good, we have no choice but to pay as much attention to our common conceptual structure as to the properties that structure might be reaching towards. Intuitions are supposed to provide evidence for philosophical analysis. Insofar as one of the targets of such analysis is implicit or explicit conceptual structure, surely they do. When there's a widespread intuition about a case, this is sometimes best explained by supposing that that intuition reflects such structure. When we so explain the intuition, 
the intuition has the status of evidence for the explanation we give. A concrete example, Goldman's discussion of Henry, who is unknowingly driven into an area where there are many fake barns and who, looking at a real barn, thinks that it is a barn. Goldman observes that if we are only told that Henry is driving around Pennsylvania, sees a barn, and thinks, huh, oh, that's a barn, we will be inclined to say he knows he's seen a barn. If we are also told about the fake barns, we're inclined to say that in such a case, Henry doesn't know that he is looking at a barn. Goldman considers various accounts of knowledge that validate the intuitions in question and settles on one of them on which knowing P requires that one's belief that P be reliable in a particular way. The knower must be able to discriminate the actual state of affairs P from various relevant possible possibilities. Goldman explicitly argues for this proposal by observing that our inclinations, his word, to make judgments about various cases are correlated with whether the case is described in such a way as to presuppose that Henry is unable to discriminate the area's fake barns from its real barns. Now I'm going to quote a little paragraph from Goldman. A person knows that P, Goldman writes, only if the actual state of affairs in which P is true is distinguishable or discriminable by him from a relevant possible state of affairs in which P is false. In the original description of the barn case, case C, call it, where there is no mention of fake barns, there's no hint of any relevant possible state of affairs in which the object in question is not a barn but is indistinguishable by Henry from the actual state of affairs. Hence, we're initially inclined to say that Henry knows. Given that the district Henry has entered is full of barn facsimiles, there is a relevant alternative state of affairs that is indistinguishable by Henry from the actual state of affairs. So once apprised of the facsimiles in the district, in let us call it case C prime, we are inclined to deny that Henry knows. Call the property of Henry's belief that we sense to be lacking in the full-blown case reliability. Part of Goldman's argument, as I would reconstruct it here, pretty clearly involves premises like one and two, one, we have a stable and strong inclination to say that Henry's barn belief is knowledge when given case C, and a stable and strong inclination to say that Henry's barn belief isn't knowledge when given case C prime. Two, in case C, there is no hint that Henry's belief is not reliable. In case C prime, there is a suggestion that it is not. If we assume, as surely Goldman is assuming, something along the lines of three, Nothing else about the cases is relevant to explain the difference in our inclinations towards C and C prime. We are in a position to explain one with four. Our stable and strong inclinations about cases like Henry's and about whether a belief is knowledge are sensitive to whether or not it appears to us that the belief is reliable. But of course, this pattern of explanation is one in which we explain the existence of an intuition, that is, we explain one, with a hypothesis about conceptual structure. If we add to four something else that Goldman is presumably assuming, namely five, when our judgments about whether something is F are sensitive to whether it is G, that is a reason, all else being equal, to think that Fs are Gs, we are in a position to conclude that we have reason to think that knowledge requires reliability. It seems to me that many passages in analytic philosophy in the last 50 or so years in which philosophers make points by appeal to examples should be understood in much the way I'm proposing that this passage should. I want, at this point, to compare my take on the role of intuition in philosophy with Herman's. Herman is no friend of the idea that intuitions have a role in philosophy, and I am. But the distance between our views is not so great, and it is, I think, illuminating to see exactly what it is. Acknowledging that there are different accounts of the nature and role of intuition, Herman focuses on the view that, A, intuitions are, one, mental states with propositional content, either sui generis states, seemings, or beliefs with a particular etiology, two, uh, uh, they're mental states which have a distinctive phenomenology, and three, they're mental states that are based solely on conceptual content. And four, they have a special evidential status 
they are in so, uh, they are rock bottom in some sense and need no metal uh, need no justification. Right? So Herman focuses on the view that uh, intuitions are as described in A and B. Analytic philosophers rely on intuitions so characterized for evidence, or at least as a source of evidence. Herman is, Herman is inclined to dismiss the idea that there is a distinctive phenomenology that accompanies what philosophers are voicing when they express intuitions, observing that he is unaware of any such funny feelings when he reads the work of Getty or Goldman or Kripke. And I, too, am an intuition zombie. Let's agree to strike A1 from the characterization of intuition and call the resulting job description for intuitions I. Herman, for the most part, attacks views on which intuitions, so understood, are the contents of beliefs that we give voice to when confronted with philosophical cases. For example, in discussing Goldman's barn example, Herman identifies the putative intuitions that Goldman would describe himself as invoking as consisting of two claims. C1, in the first scenario, where fakes are not mentioned, Henry doesn't know. C2, in the second scenario, uh, Henry does know. C2, in the second scenario, Henry does not know. On this interpretation, intuitions are beliefs come contents of judgments about cases. It is not hard to show, and Herman does show, that these don't fit the job description I. As Herman argues, C1 and C2 are not candidates for rock bottom evidential status, and Goldman is not well understood as thinking otherwise. All of this marks a difference between Herman and me, but at least some of the difference here is merely verbal. I don't identify intuitions with judgments about cases, nor with the contents of such judgments. Intuitions are rather certain psychological facts that often result in our making judgments with the relevant contents. I gave reasons for thinking of intuitions in this way at the beginning of the paper. A single person's intuitions are often in conflict. We don't want to say that just because someone has conflicting intuitions, they have inconsistent beliefs. Do the psychological facts with which I say we should identify intuitions have rock bottom evidential status? Well, frankly, I'm not a fan of talking that way about any evidence, being myself something of a fan of Quine's two dogmas. But surely such facts have, for the person whose psychology they are facts about, pretty secure evidential status. You could probably convince me, with a lot of work, that I don't have a stable and strong inclination to judge that Henry doesn't know in the second scenario. Just as the doctor in an old example of Keith Lehrer's manages to convince a patient that a state she reports as a pain isn't really a pain but an inch. But this doesn't mean that my knowledge about my inclinations isn't evidentially basic for me in an important sense. This difference is related to a difference between Herman and me about what is going on in passages like the one from Goldman, which I discussed just a bit ago. I see such passages as involving, among other things, an abductive inference, but Herman does not. Herman's main complaint about interpreting such passages in the way that I do is, and I quote, in an abductive inference with C is the exponandum and T is the exponons, the question of whether C is the case is typically not under discussion. And Herman's point is well taken. But surely what we should conclude is not that the relevant passages are not best reconstructed as abductive arguments. Rather, we should conclude that the exponandum of the argument is the fact that the philosopher, and the philosopher assumes most other philosophers, make the relevant judgment. And that is not up for debate, and I'm sure Herman would agree. Are intuitions, in my sense, thereof based solely on conceptual competence? Well, again, as a fan of Quine, I am no fan of this way of talking. And in any case, as I have characterized intuitions, they may be the result of any number of things, including contingent collateral knowledge about the property a case is supposed to focus us on. This is why, in my reconstruction of Goldman's argument, the final premise, the one that gets us from facts about concepts to ones about properties, is hedged with a ceteris paribus clause. Intuitions are the result of our applying our concepts to descriptions without doing empirical investigation. As things stand, they're a way to get some evidence about what we are and are not sensitive to 
in applying a concept. I suppose I agree with Herman that saying that intuitions are based solely on conceptual competence is a bad way of describing them. It doesn't follow that they aren't a source of evidence for what I called above conceptual structure. Herman and I don't disagree, I think, we don't disagree that there are intuitions characterized as I have been characterizing them. We do seem to disagree about their role in philosophical argumentation, as well as about what it is that philosophical analysis is and should be trying to do. The disagreement is not, I think, really about the range of things that play an evidential role in philosophy. Herman thinks that just about anything might play an evidential role in philosophy. He believes, I think, that the idea that intuitions have a distinguished role in philosophical evidence badly, indeed very badly, overestimates their importance. I agree that just about anything can play uh, an evidential role in philosophy, and that a great deal of what is evidence in philosophy comes not from gazing at our inner ophalomo. Oh, oh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, ophal ophalos? but from the sciences. I think where Herman and I differ most fundamentally is about what philosophers are doing when they try to give accounts of things like knowledge or free action. Herman's view, I think, is that they are simply trying to say something illuminating about properties and relations, and that our concepts of these properties and relations are of no particular philosophical interest. Myself, I think we have no choice in philosophically interesting cases than to proceed cautiously open to the possibility that there is no property or relation that our words or concepts are directed on. Not because those concepts are as empty of content as the concept phlogiston, but because they are often massively partial or painfully indeterminate. Since this is generally an open possibility, and surely sometimes how things in fact are, philosophical analysis has to be conceptual analysis, for often there is nothing else for it to be. <laughs>